All right, what is up, guys? Welcome to the Tony and Dakota podcast. Today, we got a special virtual guest that Tony is going to introduce. This is Dr. Jamil Sayage. He is an international transformation coach, uh, an integrative naturopathic physician, energy healer, master neurolinguistic programming practitioner, uh, the host of Transformation Starts Today podcast, and an international number one best-selling author. He works with leaders, champions, and high performers from all walks of life, including world champion athletes, best-selling authors, entrepreneurs, business professionals, and more to experience peace, happiness, fulfillment, and create an extraordinary life without regret. Dr. Jamil. Thank you so much, Tony and Dakota. So wonderful to be with you and your listeners. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on, man. So uh, I know we have a friend in common because how I heard about you was that you'd made a post saying that you wanted to be on podcasts, you wanted to be on shows, you wanted to be out there in front of the public more, you wanted to speak on some of these stages, you know, virtual stages. And uh, Josh Musman was the one who tagged me. And uh, how do you know? How do you know the Musmans? How do you know Josh? Yeah, so Josh and his brother Eric are friends of mine. Eric and I go back a little bit further to about 2018. We met in a NLP training in Arizona and we hit it off, became friends. And then we ended up meeting again 2019 in the, uh, the more advanced training uh, for the NLP. And we were together for two weeks straight, probably 12, 15 hours a day. <laughs> and it was awesome. And then I actually met both of them again in Hawaii at a training Um this past September, and I got to meet Josh for the first time, Joshua. That's awesome. So for anybody who doesn't know, what is NLP? Okay, so Neuro Linguistic Program, I think it can be defined in, in many ways. The way I like to think about it is it's the user's manual for how the mind creates experience. And so if you can understand how is it that the most successful people in any field create the results that they do, then you can replicate in a way the strategy that they came up with. And if you can understand how is it that the external world, things are happening the way they happen, but each individual seems to have a, have a different experience yeah. and they're having a different experience because of whatever the story, the meaning, the interpretation, all the things that they're doing internally that we're usually unconscious of. And when you can become conscious of it, you can use it as like an asset to change the way you experience the world and create new results. That's awesome. Yeah, I think uh, I just got a new model of the brain and how memories work from Gary Brecka when we were at uh, MenaceCon 2023. Gary Brecka got up on stage and he was showing us a model of the brain. And it's funny because it works well with like mental emotional release. It's very similar in the way that his understanding is that basically uh, in order to go back from your prefrontal cortex to uh, whatever this part is, to find <laughs> to get back to your brain, to, to find a memory, uh, the memory is linked to an emotion. Mm. So uh, there's only one pathway to retrieve a memory. And that's by going back and feeling the emotion and then pulling up the memory and then bringing it forward to your, the, the, you know, more conscious decision-based portion of the brain. And uh, I thought that was interesting to like get somebody else who, it seems like all of these experts are coming to the exact same conclusion. Like breath work is important. We need more oxygen. We need, you know, to eat better. And then I see that you're more of a, a naturopathic doctor. And I hadn't seen that like NMD before what is what is that how did you find out about this degree that's not mainstream yeah. and like how long did you go to school what does that process even look like absolutely I'd be happy to share that these are also awesome, awesome way to start a podcast and so so NMD another designation would be ND it really depends on the state or where, where you where you are where you're at in the world and so naturopathic doctor or naturopathic medical doctor think of it like it, it's a conventionally trained physician that's also trained in nutrition and acupuncture and physical adjustments like chiropractic type of stuff you learn how to use herbal medicines like plant medicines and it's a very holistic perspective of seeing the body and so when this and we can i can share a story in a little while that can give you kind of the background but essentially i really got into health when i was younger around 14 is when i had like a little health epiphany in my own life 
wasn't doing well physically and had a lot of symptoms and it was like intuitively just feeling just came up saying it's your diet and as I look back in hindsight it's like well I had the worst diet of any human being I'd ever seen <laughs> to date <laughs> but the thing is also I didn't have any reason to think it was my diet because I didn't look into that stuff it wasn't like in my family's like consciousness if you want to call it like that so it was weird but I felt it made some changes, some of them overnight, some of them over the course of a couple of years, but quickly within a month or two, stopped getting sick, slept better, felt better all the time. And my, I went from one of the worst people on the track team to one of the better people <laughs> uh, in my year. And it was an awesome feeling. And I started getting excited and I started thinking, what's this all about? And I started getting obsessed with health. And then I would meet people, whether it be family or, family or friends or people at parties or whatever it was. And they would tell me about these challenges they're going through. And things that I was learning from the computer, from books, things like that, nutrition, lifestyle, medicine, they were getting better. They were Their medical conditions were resolving. And I was getting really excited about that. And so fast forward, when I decided to go to this program, I never heard about it. I was going to go to a conventional medical school, and then I was going to continue to learn about nutrition and holistic medicine, because most of my mentors were medical doctors, and they just kind of went out of their way after they finished school to learn it on their own. And then so when I found out there's an actual school for this, you know, it's a four year medical school, just like all medical schools. And then the you know, residencies after if you choose to do it, it's it's optional, unlike it's mandatory in the conventional route. But it was truly what spoke to my spirit and just helping people on a holistic level. You know, if you've got hepatitis, you're not just a walking liver. You know, you've got your whole life that led up until this moment. You've got the whole story. You've got the interconnectedness. And if you just focus on the one spot, it's a very reductionistic way of seeing it. And you miss the point, like get to the root cause of what's actually going on. Otherwise you're just masking symptoms. And so that's kind of the big picture of what naturopathic medicine is all about. So how did you, first let's talk about what you were eating. Cause I think a lot of people struggle with that. It's like they're eating crap. And the funny thing is I didn't even know that I was eating bad when I was younger. And Tony's actually one person who's like, dude, like you're eating some bull crap. I remember when I was boxing, actually, the guy was like, Hey, how long have you been smoking for? Well, I didn't smoke at all. It's just, I was lacking the nutrients. So my face got really flushed and I was exhausted because I wasn't eating properly. So what were you eating? And then how did you find out what you should be eating? Cause I think everybody knows, Oh, I should be eating meat, vegetables, all this stuff, but there's so many diets and different ways to do it. How did you actually know specifically what your body needed? Yeah. Or no meat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so when I first started, uh, so up until from being a kid until 14. So 14, when I was a freshman in high school is when I kind of had that wake up call. Prior to that, I was living on usually three ish liters of soda a day. McDonald's and Burger King was like my life probably four to five days a week. Uh, you know, it's funny people say everything in moderation. And for me, it was like, yeah, yeah, I'll have a little bit of junk on Monday, a little bit on Tuesday, a little bit on Wednesday. It was everything in moderation. <laughs> and so I was, you know, the pizza, the American Chinese food, the KFC, I hated vegetables. I, I barely drank water. I didn't, I ate some fruit, but for the most part, it was, everything was processed. Everything was fried. Everything was sugary and fat and salt and soda. And none of it was nutritious and like looking back very little if anything of what i ate back then i touch now mm -hmm. and the way i eat now is very similar over the last probably 10 to 12 years if not longer and so yeah and so that was what i ate and then as it relates to what was the second part of how did i find out so i think uh this was 2004 and i think youtube had come out around then it was around that time because if it wasn't youtube it was just a google search but either way I was looking up because when I had that feeling, it's your diet. I looked up, well, how are we supposed to eat? Like what's, what's healthy food? What's good for you? And there were doctors that would write blogs and they would talk about nutrition and they would say, Hey, this is what is you should be eating. And I know it's more nuanced than that now, but as a 14 year old, it was like, Oh, that's the way it was like a single, this, whoever's, whoever's opinion I was reading was like the law. It's like, there it is. And I said, everything I'm eating is wrong. <laughs> everything I'm eating is bad on this guy's list. And so I started making those changes and some of the overnight changes, I went from three liters of soda a day to a gallon of water a day. Wow. And that was just an overnight thing. And I probably had one of the worst headaches of my life for like some withdrawal. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, there's any repercussions. Cause that's a funny thing too, is when you go from eating bad to eating healthy, a lot of times you get like diarrhea, like your body just gets fricked up. Oh yeah. Like one of the things to think about is in naturopathic medicine, we call it a healing crisis and uh, a conventional medicine might, might call it a Herxheimer reaction. But basically it's when you're going from a, a sick state to a healthy state, sometimes you get worse before you get better. 
Mm. Because the body has to let go of all the bad stuff, let's say. And in order to get rid of it, some of it is like sequestered in the fat and stuff. You got to get it into the blood. You got to excrete it. You got to do all these things. Sometimes, sometimes you feel worse before you feel better. And so I definitely went through some withdrawal with the dramatic decrease of the caffeine and the soda. And then, you know, as I've gotten older, cutting other foods out of my system that I know just don't serve me and don't serve most people. And just the mental clarity, the energy, the the not needing stimulants or anything like that and having more energy than people who do. <laughs> it's just a, uh, it's a very freeing, liberating, like vital vitality inducing way of eating and living, it seems, at least for me. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate? It's not like what you see on HGTV. We created a course to show you how to really invest and create a profitable flipping and wholesaling business. We give you marketing strategies like how to pull lists, who we target, and where we find the money. We go over sales, which includes live calls and negotiations, scripts, role playing, and so much more. Everything that you need to know to flip houses is in this course. And if there's anything that we missed, we will create a video to answer your specific question. This knowledge has made us over a million dollars and we're selling it today for just $997. Click the link below. Have you found uh, any like new foods that you think are super helpful for energy or for, um, you know, I heard there's a big correlation between gut health and your emotions. Have you found anything else with like your gut health or like, anything that everybody should be implementing in their diet that they're maybe not right now? So I'd say that I'm going to answer it as the inverse. There is things, it's easier to say what people probably shouldn't okay. eat versus what they should. Uh, when you get into what people should eat, you get more general and vague because that's the only way you're going to actually uh, encompass most people, right? So in general, eat real food. That's a good start. Pay attention to your body. Everyone's different. You know, um, Tony mentioned earlier, you know, like, or not meat. Some people thrive on meat. Some people thrive being vegan. But in, in the research that I've seen and in experiences that I've had with people, most people don't thrive be being vegan, but there are people who do. And so you can't say for sure whether or not you or somebody else is. You, won't, you might not know for years. But in general, eat real food. Avoid the, the chemicals and the ingredients you can't pronounce you know, the foods that you're eating should be made of food. Like what's the ingredient in steak? Steak. What's the ingredient in broccoli? Broccoli. But you get a box of something that's got 50 ingredients and you go, I can't pronounce half of these. And there's vegetable oils and seed oils and all these things that shouldn't be there. So in general, I think most people thrive when you pull out processed sugar, when you pull out vegetable oils, seed oils. So the vegetable oils would be things like canola oil. Mm -hmm. Anything in general, in my mind, outside of olive oil and coconut oil, there's a handful of other ones that are probably decent, but those are the, those are the two safe ones for most people. But outside of that, vegetable oils, seed oils, processed sugar, fried foods, those mess people up so often. And then pay attention to your body. As you're eating, how do you feel? You know, you're eating to get energy. If you eat and then you get that stereotypical Thanksgiving feeling after where you're just sitting there just spent and you've got gut issues going on, you've got brain fog, you've got a headache, and this could be delayed. This could come up six hours later. This could come out tomorrow, you know, and people may not equate the two. You get stung by a bee and you're allergic and you just swell up and you can't breathe. You go, oh, it was the bee sting. But you eat something for breakfast and your knee hurts tomorrow and it's inflamed. You don't necessarily say it was the what I have, whatever I had for breakfast yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so you can do food allergy testing and things like that. It's not hundred percent accurate, but it is definitely pointing you in the right direction. And paying attention, like you said, how do you optimize your gut health? It's going to be different for everybody, but don't eat foods that inflame you. And you can either test for that, or you can do what's called an elimination diet, which is you cut out most of the foods that offend people. The most common allergies for most people are dairy from cow, gluten containing foods, which is usually your breads and your pastas, but there are alternatives, corn, soy, tree nuts. And I think there's one more, but those are the, the common ones. And let's so you, that's most people's diet. Keep that in mind because I said, um, what is it? Um, you know, high fructose corn syrup, vegetable oils, a lot of these things come from soybean oil. They come from these ingredients. And I think I heard that soybean oil has become, don't quote me on the number, but it's not too far off. It's like 40% of the American calorie intake comes from soybean oil. And that's a food that nobody ever ate not that long ago. <laughs> and so when you come from that space of realizing most of us are eating foods and we're not doing it intentionally, we're usually not aware of it. We don't think it's that bad for us because it's being sold. So we think it, it can't be unsafe because why would it be in the grocery store? 
but there's so much, you know, lobbying and money when it comes to like these big food companies, there's a lot of foods that are, they're food like products. Most people don't eat as much food as they think they do. They eat fake food. And when you're eating fake food, that's what your body's building itself with. And then you can do that when you're young and kind of get away with it. You probably still have symptoms, but you don't notice it as much. And then you get to 30 and 35 and 40. And then all these symptoms start happening and the energy is not, you know, where, where it could be. And you get told you have a certain condition by a doctor, whatever it is. So going back to the original question that Tony asked about naturopathic medicine, it's seeing a person in a holistic fashion. And what are the, the rules of health, the determinants of health, and how can we help you live in alignment with that instead of li- like Mark Hyman, he's a medical doctor, pretty famous in the functional medicine space. And he says, everything, every time you eat, you're voting, basically. Everything you put in your mouth either feeds health or feeds disease. Yeah. It's the same kind of idea, just like in a personal development space. Every action that you take either gets you further or closer away from where you want to be. And so when you can think along those lines, it just shifts how you show up in the world and shifts how you decide to fuel your body. Mm. Yeah, and there's, uh, I, I know that Dr. Matt always recommends people read the book Wired to Eat. And Mm. specifically in that book, it's basically like, hey, eat something. And then he even talks about like checking your blood sugar afterwards, you know, for people who who uh, have fruit or people who have uh, rice, like, well, it depends on like, does your blood sugar spike after you eat rice? And then like nine months later, after you've gotten thinner and you've got less insulin resistance going on, you eat rice and then you check your blood sugar and it's completely different because the physiology of your body's actually changed because of the the habits that you've created. And uh, something else that I wonder too, uh, 10X uh, is a seminar that we've been to. They talked about gene mutations. Um, Have you done any studies around uh, gene mutations and like how that can affect somebody's ability? Because like, for instance, I started taking L-methionine and uh, 5-MTHF for a couple of gene mutations that I've got. And I've noticed that I can consume a lot more dairy now without having the adverse side effects that I did before. Yeah, so there's two parts to that question. I'll answer the second one first. Um, There are certain genetic mutations that people call SNPs, like SNPs. And if you have, you can get tested if you have them. And I I forgot the percentages, but each one depends on the percentage of the population would have it. But let's say one of them would be an MTHFR mutation. And if you have that, you don't methylate well. So for example, there might be certain vitamins that you're not really absorbing too well from food. Because your body normally takes that vitamin in and then it does something called methylation and adds a methyl group to it. And now it's able to be used and absorbed the way it's supposed to be. But if your body is having a hard time methylate, you basically become deficient in that vitamin. And over time, you can have a lot of issues. But all of a sudden, a doctor recommends, hey, take this methylated form or you get like an injection, like a methylated B12 or something like that. And if you were actually deficient in that or you had the mutation rather it's night and day difference in terms of the felt impact in your life in a positive way. And then, so what was, that was the 10 X part. The first part you said, Oh, I wanted to speak to, um, it's funny. There's so many different ideas going in my head right now. (laughs) The first part you were speaking about, Oh, different people eat differently. Yeah. And then your body can change over time so that the environment, the internal environment is different. Yeah. So this idea that we all are different and one aspect of it is evolutionarily and this is something for everyone to pay attention to, where is your family from? Like if you have an Eskimo, for example, and you put them on a vegan diet, they almost always get really, really sick. Hmm. But if you're living in India and you're on the equator or near it, you might have a better shot with that. But, you know, so where, where where's your family from? And what is like kind of the evolutionary history of how the people that you've descended from eat? And if you eat similar to the way they eat, your body typically does better. And so it's an interesting thing. We live in this amazing world now that we're able to travel and we can kind of live anywhere we want. But if you're used to being, you know, let's say you you come from some Northern like Scandinavian country, and then you decide you're going to live on the equator and you're going to eat completely differently than all your ancestors, that may or may not work for you. And so it's a very interesting, there's so, so many nuances to it. And this conversation could be, you know, 50 hours, <laughs> but it's really individualized. And I recommend anyone who's interested in this, find a practitioner, whether in, you know, it, it could be any type of a practitioner, but the key is not their title, but obviously their experience and their knowledge, 
more often than not, somebody who's either a functional medicine doctor or a naturopathic doctor would probably have more insight into this than a conventional doctor, but there are some amazing conventional doctors that do have this as well. Either way, find someone who can tailor it to you and give you an individualized approach, not just say one size fits all, you've got this condition, this is what you need. It, that almost never applies. Like it's gotta be tailored to you. Are you letting deals fall through the cracks because you don't have good systems in place? We've been there before and we've tried several different CRMs and RE Simply has been the best. RE Simply tracks your KPIs, does automatic follow-ups for you, and even records your incoming phone calls. The system is simple to use and has more features than we even know what to do with. If you're looking for a great CRM, try RE Simply today. We put the link in the description. Check it out now. Yeah, I've noticed that a lot with doctors. And I, every time I talk to doctors, a lot of times, like especially the conventional ones, I go in there and I'm like, dude, I don't think they know who I am because I'm the kind of person who only goes to the doctor whenever I'm like messed up. And then they mm -hmm. treat me as if I'm just like, like just making it all up and saying the craziest stuff because they probably have a lot of people who go in there who are like, like you look healthy, yeah. young. So I remember I went in and I had COVID and I was like, yeah, I'm like not feeling good. It's been a couple of days. Like, oh, no, I bet you're fine. They tested me like, oh, gosh, you got COVID, dude. Same thing with strep throat. They're like, I don't think you have strep throat. I'm pretty sure you don't. I'm like, I think I do. They're like, no, nah, I don't think you do. They test me. OK, you do have it. So it's interesting how they always tell me that I don't have whatever I feel like I actually do have. And so it's nice, like having doctors and stuff who actually will look at your blood work, who will look at your genes and like actually help you. And like, uh, cause then it's not a question of if you have this or not, it's, we already know that there's something going on It's what is it? And then, uh, so yeah, I think that it's, it's really nice having the doctors that are willing to actually look at it and know mm -hmm. that there's going to be something that they can help with. Absolutely. I appreciate you sharing that. I agree. And I, and I think that, when we think, I look at health as mind, body, spirit. And when you've got all three, and that's where I combine like the medical side, the mental side from like the coaching, the NLP, emotional release work, and then like the energy healing, and you put all three together and it's a very different story. Like you said, if you're not feeling at hundred percent, something's going on. And so if you go to see a doctor or a healthcare practitioner, whoever it is, and they tell you everything's normal, if you don't feel normal, then Clearly that's not true, but what it does mean is everything that they tested was normal, at, at least normal being in the, the reference range, which is a whole different conversation that <laughs> isn't always great, but just coming from that space of not, you know, not, unfortunately, when you get tested by a general physician for the routine blood work, you might think, oh yeah, I'm going in for my yearly checkup and I'm getting tested on all the important things. Not always. Uh, some of the tests they do are very important, like especially usually the basic ones, but they, they're often not doing the ones that would really serve you necessarily, but it's also because insurance may not cover it. It's more expensive, things of that nature. So there's a, it's, it's nuanced. It's, they're not doing it like maliciously or anything, but just coming from that space of if you're not feeling normal and you've got symptoms, there's something deeper going on and it may not be physical. And that might be why all your tests are coming back normal because it might be an emotional component. I've worked with people that have had autoimmune conditions for 30 years and it stemmed from abuse they had when they were a child. And I took them through an emotional release and their autoimmune disease went away. Wow. I've had people who've had nerve pain, chronic, eight out of 10, whole right side of their bodies on fire. Five years, eight years, 10 years. And take them through a release process from something that happened when they were a kid and their nerve pain went away. But they've seen every pain doctor, they've gotten epidural injections, they've taken the meds and nothing worked physically because it wasn't a physical problem it was manifesting in the physical level so that's why i think it's important that people are working with somebody that understands human beings can be really simple and we can be really complicated and when when we're looking at it from these nuanced ways we find things that other people typically miss so the majority of your marketing when i was looking over your, your uh different social media and that sort of thing the majority of your marketing is centered around uh, mental coaching, uh, helping people break through limiting beliefs, mental, emotional release, that sort of thing. What inspired you to get into that or what led you into pursuing more uh, clients in that direction of the, the coaching and mentality and that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. So I have a story that I would love to share that I think would answer the question and probably much more in, in a good way though. I think it'll really help uh, people who are listening. So I mentioned, you know, 14 got into health that continued on. And then at 15, 
I got exposed to the work of Tony Robbins for the first time and I'd never heard of him. And so there I was at 15, it was like, it was 2000, I'm 32 now. So it was 2005 and YouTube was out and I started seeing so, like that intuition kicked back in the same one that said it's your diet. Now it's saying go on YouTube and type in motivation 2005. And I didn't know, I, that, very specific. <laughs> and I wrote it down on YouTube and um, it was one of those little montage videos. What it was it? Popped up and he was like, you have potential. You can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Cookie Monster. <laughs> I love it. No, and so, but it's uh, it was just like Tony Robbins, Les Brown, Brian Tracy kind of edited epic music in the background. I didn't know any of those guys. And so I'm watching this video and it just really like grabbed me. And then so I watched a couple other ones. And before I knew it, I'm watching this like hour long video of Tony doing some intervention at a seminar. And in 45 minutes, he helps somebody get over something that they've been seeing a therapist for 20 years for. And I sat there going, and then they followed up with them a year later and two years later, and it was, it was gone. And I was like, how the hell did he do that? And that's when I found out about NLP. And NLP is the foundation of what Tony does. And so I started studying that, reading as many books as I could at 15. But now I was speaking to all these people and I started working with people around their health with everything I was learning and around their mindset with some of the NLP stuff I was learning and some of like the motivational stuff I was learning and how people were kind of getting in their own way. And then also at 15, I started wondering what are the other areas of a really fulfilling life and the relationships you know, popped into my mind. And I said, well, I'm not in one, but whenever I do start dating, I want to do it right. So I got obsessed with that. And I bought tapes and books from some of the top marriage therapists and dating coaches in the world. And I wanted to learn about attraction. I wanted to learn about communication. I wanted to learn about masculine, feminine energy dynamics and What's the difference that made the difference? Why were some people 90 and they got married at 17 and they were just so in love and passionate and thriving and other people were on their 15th divorce. And it's like, what caused that? What was the breakdown? And so I wanted to learn that. And then, so I'd just be speaking with people. And there I was at first when I was 14, I'd be speaking to an uncle who's head of internal medicine at a hospital. And he's like, oh, Jamil, what have you been up to? And in my head, I'm like, oh, he's a doctor, like he'll get it. And I just start like blasting him with all this like stuff I was learning about health. And he's sitting there getting excited, but going, wow, like, where'd you hear this? Where'd you learn that? Because conventionally, you don't really learn too much about nutrition and lifestyle medicine and holistic medicine and stuff like that. And so he didn't really know anything I was talking about. And so I shared it and I, and I was, I was naive in hindsight, but there was aspects of what I was saying that was true. And so I, I, I remember saying to him, yeah, for example, you have a patient who has diabetes. All you have to do is these like five things and stop these things and they won't be diabetic anymore. Now, I know it's way more nuanced than that now, but he, three, four months later tells me, I told them to do all the things that you said and they, they got off their meds and they're doing really well. And it landed so strongly because I was so excited about it, but I was learning about it almost like for me. But here was the first example of something that helped somebody else that like lit this fire under me of excitement. And then the same thing happened when I got into the relationship side and the, the mental emotional side, I'd be talking to people, I'm 15, they're 35, they're married, they're having issues. I end up mediating some conversations for them. And then I find out a couple months later, they didn't get divorced and they, they said it was because of our conversations. And it was like, oh my gosh, this stuff is working. And like, I love this. And so I got obsessed and I would spend you know, all my free time, like doing this learning about this stuff. And then I uh, started studying all the different world religions when I was 17, grew up Christian, but just studied like all of them for the last uh, 17 to now. And uh, 19 years old, and this is where kind of the story really begins of why I do what I do. That was like kind of the beginning stage of it. 19, I was at uh, Fordham University in the Bronx in New York City. That's where I went to college in my second year. And my dad had a brain aneurysm. And for anyone who's not familiar with what that is, imagine a blood vessel in the brain, think of it like a tube, starts to balloon out. If you're fortunate, you have one of the worst headaches of your life. You go to the hospital, hopefully they take care of it, and hopefully you leave and you're okay. My dad wasn't as fortunate. His brain aneurysm ruptured. Imagine that tube, that, that tube like bursting. He was in a four-hour brain surgery. Now, prior to that, I, I, left, I left this part out. I was part of this pre-med group <clears throat> uh, at Fordham. And they basically had to fight to keep their funding every year. And they had to go to Albany to like, you know, and they, they would always bring some students who were part of the program to basically say, this is how I benefit it. Please don't cut the funding. And they said, Jamil, would you be one of the students that go? And I said, yeah, sure. And we were, we were going to leave Friday morning, come back Sunday night. 
And uh, I just remember Tuesday, Wednesday rolls around and I said I'd go and that intuition comes up and it says something's not right, don't go. And I just ignored it. And then Wednesday, stronger, something's not right, don't go. Thursday, it's yelling at me. Something's not right, don't go. And I kept thinking up until that point, I already said yes. Like I told him I'd go, I, I, need, I need to go. But it got so loud and it was so uncomfortable to keep ignoring it that I said, you know what, let me listen to this. And side note for everyone who's listening, where in your life right now are you ignoring your intuition? Where in your life right now are you being, are you receiving some type of signal that something doesn't belong in your world anymore or something you should be doing something or not be doing something, but you ignore it. And almost always when we ignore our intuition, it's to our own detriment. It's almost always like in hindsight, I should have listened to that. And so there I was, I listened to it, sent an email, Friday rolls around, normal day, Saturday, normal day, Sunday morning is the morning my dad had his brain aneurysm. He was in a locked room. I broke the door to get him out. If I wasn't home, he would have died. I wouldn't have been home until that evening. So then we're in a, we're at the hospital. He's in a four hour brain surgery. We're being told he's got less than a 5% chance of survival. And after the neurosurgeon said it was the worst aneurysm he'd ever seen, if he, if he survived, he'd likely be in a coma and never wake up. And four hours went by and he survived. And so already it was a miracle. I walk into the room and to give context, you know, my dad was 49 years old. He was a family practice physician and he was also one of the top Elvis impersonators in the world. You know, music was his life. He's toured with Elvis's actual band. He's in the Elvis Hall of Fame. He's, uh, he's, he's done amazing things, massive charity shows, thousands of people. He's traveled the world and, you know, music was so much of his life and he was such a passionate, loving ball of energy, like this amazing guy. And there he is laying on the hospital bed and I've never seen a human being, you know, that vulnerable. And in that moment, I had these two primary feelings. First, I had this sense of helplessness because given what I knew at the time, it felt like I really couldn't do anything. And I'm being told by these nurses, he'll die at any moment, like likely. And so I'm just feeling like I'm waiting. And then the second feeling, which is the foundation of why I do what I do, I had this profound sense of regret and the regret came from the feeling that I took my, or the thought rather, I took my relationship with my dad for granted, that I didn't know him the way that I could, that at 19 my, and leading up until that point, my priorities were my friends. I was a track athlete. So running video games, movies, things like that, not let me really get to know my dad, you know, man to man, soul to soul. Let me see what he's all about. Let me learn from him. That wasn't really on my radar at all. And I was fortunate in the sense, you know, I loved him, he loved me, but we didn't just spend that much time together and we didn't know each other in that way. And so now I'm feeling like I blew it. I'm not going to have that opportunity. And I was very fortunate that we had three more years before he did pass away. And in those three years, I took a few years off after college to be one of his primary caregivers. And, you know, I got my prayers answered. You know, he was in a coma for several months, but when he did came, come out of it slowly, but surely he was never hundred percent back to the same. But we helped him make as close to a full recovery as it seems like he was going to. And so much of what I had learned from 14 to 19 about nutrition and mindset and all these things and psychology was like a training ground because he was pretty unhealthy in his lifestyle. And part of him making such a recovery came from all the things I was implementing in his diet and nutrition stuff that was getting him off his meds and changing the way he felt. And I remember he had short-term memory loss because of the aneurysm. And the psychological stuff I was learning, I was trying things out that I was like making up and it was working and I was making short-term memory, long-term memory. And it was like really cool and it was so gratifying. And in those three years though, it was also challenging. You know, I had some of my highest highs and my lowest lows. On the one hand, like I said, I was spending 10, 15 hours a day with him. We were going to physical therapy together, boxing together. He sings, I sing, he plays the drums. We were doing everything and he became one of my best friends. And on the other hand, there were days where, you know, he forgot who I was because the short-term memory loss got really bad and it became more like long-term in that moment. There were five minute seizures he would have in my arms and I didn't have any medical knowledge and the phone's across the room and I don't know if he's dying. There were so many moments where we're going to the hospital thinking this is it. The first 500 days or so I would go to bed when he came home wondering, was that the last time I'm going to see my dad? And then I'd wake up in a fog almost thinking, was that all a dream? And it shifted so much of the way I saw the world. And I remember learning that every single day, 150,000 people don't wake up. And there I was waking up, but not realizing that. So taking it for granted and recognizing that, well, my dad woke up today 
And he might not be here tomorrow. He might not even be here later on today, but he's here right now. So rather than complain about he's not the way he used to be, how about I make the most of this situation? And then over time, that, that awareness expanded. And they said, well, that's true for my mom as well, and my sister, and everyone that I know, and me too. I'm here now. I might not be here tomorrow. So why am I playing small? Why am I living in fear? And so I started being with people in such a way that if this was the last time we'd ever see each other, it was worthy of being the last time. And I remember being with a cousin of mine and I'm known for my hugs. And so she gives me, a, uh, I give her a hug and she gave me one of the best compliments I've ever gotten. She told me, I love your hugs. Every time you hug me, I feel like you're never going to see me again. Mm -hmm. And that was exactly what I was going for without putting words to it. And I just remember feeling so touched by that. And I've had so many compliments similar to that over the years. And so then three years go by, you know, and in those three years, two of my cousins had passed away and one was 20 and one was 21. One was hyper sudden and the other one was fairly sudden. And if you were to ask either of those guys when they were 18, you know, what are your goals and dreams for your life? Like, I promise you, neither guy would say I'd be dead in less than five years. You know, there's this perspective that the Dalai Lama says, most people live as if they're never going to die. And then they die having never really lived. And so we hold back. And so it was one thing when my dad passes, but here's two people that were 20 and 21 and when they passed, I was a uh, 19 or 20. And from, I was, yeah, I was at 19. And so from that space, it's like, wait, wait, this could happen to me. And now it was close to home. It was real. And so when my dad passed away, I remember being at a five hour wake, over 7,000 people came. I shook every single person's hand and almost everyone said, your dad saved my life. And I felt so people from every religion, walk of life, color, dress, everything. And I just felt so humbled by that. But I also had a wake up call. And the wake up call was that it felt experience. I'd been playing small. I was afraid of rejection. I cared way too much about what other people thought about me. And because of that, what if they don't like me? I'm dimming my, I'm dimming my shine. I'm robbing the world of who I could be. One of my favorite words is enthusiasm. And enthusiasm comes from ante theos or entheos. It means the God within. When you radiate enthusiastically, that divine spark that you are, that thing that makes you you, that no one else can replicate, you're radiating that. And when you radiate that, life has a way of working itself out. The people that belong in your life have, have a way of showing up and sticking around. But what, you, what most people do, what I was doing, is we wear a mask. And the mask is saying, who do I need to be to be loved? Who do I need to be to be normal and accepted and validated and special and popular and whatever else it is? But when you play that game, even when you think you win, you lose. Because I don't know you. I know your mask. So you think I love you. I don't even know you. And deep down, you know that too. So something always doesn't feel right. And so everyone is listening. Where are you wearing a mask? Where are you pretending to be something you're not? Where are you living other people's version of your life instead of the life that you know you want to be living? And so from that space, that was a wake up call for me that I said, you know, never again, I'm really going to shed it all and just be as authentic as I possibly can. And then so from that space, you know, I stayed with family for about another year or so and went through a grieving process early on that when I came out of it, you know, I just was in such a beautiful, blissful, peaceful state. And then I moved to Arizona because in those, and this goes back to one of Tony's questions earlier, while I was taking care of my dad in those three years, anyone who's been a primary caregiver knows when somebody is completely dependent on you for almost everything and you can't leave their side, that can get really exhausting, like <laughs> across the board, physical, mental, emotional, even spiritual. And I just remember only really having evenings to myself. He would go to sleep and now I have a couple hours to just me. And I'd be, I was watching this physician give a lecture and it was just fascinating. But I missed the beginning, I guess, or they cut it off or something because I didn't see who he was. And when he finished, his name popped up and it said ND. And I said, what the hell is that? Like, I never heard of that. And so when I looked it up online, I found out about this whole type of med medicine that I'd never heard about that was everything I was looking for. And so that was kind of the, the spark of that. And then uh, moved to Arizona. I spent five years over there and such a beautiful maturing experience and grew in many ways and expanded in the work that I did. Started um, doing the coaching more professionally. Up until that point, I was just coaching for free, just you know, helping people, being in conversation with people and following up and doing all these things. 
And uh, I moved to Arizona with four books. I moved back with probably a thousand <laughs> all along the lines of business and spirituality and relationships and health and mindset and all these different things. And, uh, you know, as I graduated, I finally got the opportunity um, right, right as I graduated to do this is 2018. That's where Facebook ad pops up about an NLP training. All my NLP was self-trained, all like, you know, 10, 15 different books and videos and all that. And here's this training that Dr. Matt's putting on. And I said, oh my God, I don't have an excuse. It's literally 10 minutes away. <laughs> like it's right there. <laughs> and it's four days and it was awesome. And I went, that's where I met Eric and it, we had a wonderful time. And then went to the advanced training. There's a whole amazing story about that, that if we want, I can get into later. If um, But it was very, it was a testament to being resourceful and creating the results that you want in life that you didn't think you could. If you want to talk about that, let me know and we can get into it. And then also, um, you know, Dr. Matt talks about, he's big into energy healing and he stems from Hawaii and he, this guy has made things happen that would be seen by most people as miraculous. And, you know, I worked at this holistic oncology center for a year before I went into my coaching full time. And so then I uh, got into energy work and became a Reiki master, got involved in the Hawaiian energy training, Hawaiian shamanism. And I started working with people and things that they had going on that doctors said were, you couldn't cure that, or this person's going to die from this. And they would go away in a day or in a week. And I would just think this is incredible. And so to wrap it up, you know, you said, you know, looking at my content and looking at the way I kind of market myself, it's all about helping leaders, champions, and high performers create an extraordinary life without regret. I think it's important to define the terms. For me, a leader is a person who says, I want to make a difference and impact in the world, not just me, but for my family, my company, my community, and depending on the size of my vision, my country, the world. When I think about a high performer, it's a person who says, I want to be the best that I can be at the things that matter most to me. And when I think about a champion, this is someone saying, I want to be the best, you know, period. And so some people hear that and they say, I really wish I could be a leader champion and a high performer. And the truth is, it's not something you're born as. It's a choice that you get to make moment by moment by moment. It's a standard that you hold yourself to or you don't. It's like a binary thing. And so from that space, bringing it all together, where are you living like you're never going to die? Where are you taking people in your life for granted, knowing that they woke up today and they might not tomorrow? Where are you allowing yourself to dim your shine and play small? Because you're caring way too much about what other people think. And you, you care more about what they think about you than what you think about you. And when you come from that space, it, uh, at least in my own experience, the quality of life is not too great. But when you shift out of that, it is truly incredible, like how life opens up for you and that which is meant to be for you and in your life just happens. And so I'll pause there and hear anything that you'd like to share. Yeah, that was a lot. So yeah, first of all, thank you for sharing that. Uh, that's a, there's a lot of good stuff to unpack there. Um, the biggest thing that I have a question about, honestly, it would just be uh, your masks and how somebody... Man, I've struggled with that too, obviously. I mean, I think all of us have. And then it's so hard to differentiate between whether you're wearing a mask in the moment or whether you're like, okay, like this is me in this space. This is me in this space. Is this actually me or am I changing myself for this person? You know, like, let's say when you're in a professional place, should, am I supposed to dress up and not talk as much? And then whenever you're out and, you know, like at a party, you're obviously going to act different. So how do you know which one's actually authentically you or you're putting on a facade or you're trying to get people to like you or you're like, man, this is actually me because that's what I'm finding out I was like is this me or am I doing this to get like happiness from them or like I'm different in this scenario how do you know which one's authentically you and to where you can take off that mask one of the best questions I think anyone's ever asked me <laughs> I love that man that's awesome all right so the way I think about it is it's less about what you do and more about who you're being so you might be dressing up in a certain way taking a certain action but what matters, you know, Bruce Lee's got a quote, be like water. You know, water takes the shape of the container that it's in. So water might be in a square or a circle or a triangle, and it might look different, but it's still water. Hmm. You know, I might have like, I'm somebody that has very different types of friends. I'm the kind of person that I have friends that when we're hanging out as a group, they wouldn't necessarily hang out with each other. <laughs> but like, I'm kind of that glue that keeps them together. And so from that space, how is it that when I'm with one person, I act this way? And when I'm with that person, I act completely different, but I'm being completely authentic with both of them. Yeah. Right. And so it's like from that space, I think we know when we're wearing a mask at some level, 
because it just doesn't feel right. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel good. There's a the, the level of almost like being fake. Something doesn't feel like I'm being like, this isn't the me that it's like, if, if I were to say, are you being the you that you believe you should be being? Mm-hmm. And if the answer is no, you're wearing a mask. Now wearing a mask in the context of the story that I shared sounds bad, but it, it isn't bad in a different context where you you talked about different like masks I could wear. We're all pretending all the time, you know, because we can have a whole conversation. So much of the work I do is helping people wake up to who they really are. And the thing is that who you really are is so much deeper than we realize. And so from that space, there's roles that you play. You might be a husband or a wife or a father or a mother. You might be, a, you're a friend, you're a leader, you're a business owner, you're all these things. But when you're a business owner, that's not the same hat you wear when you're taking care of a three-year-old, right? You're, you're in dad mode. You're not in boss mode necessarily. And so in that same kind of way, what is the moment calling for? And who would you need to be to create the result that you're looking for in your life? And how can you do that in a way that feels good for you? If you're doing that, you're being authentic in the same way that if I'm an actor, you know, uh, I was talking to a client the other day. I'm like, who's one of your favorite actors? And he's like, oh, Denzel Washington. I'm like, all right, great. And I go, can you think of like a handful of movies that he's done? Yeah. Have those characters been like pretty different across the different movies? He's like, oh yeah, completely different. But they're both Denzel, right? It's just ones he's pretending in different contexts, right? But he's not being inauthentic in the context of the character. He's being completely authentic. He's stepping into it fully. So what's the role that you're going to be playing? How can you play it in a way that feels good for you, that helps you get the result that you want to create? And in that way, you're being authentic. But it's almost like giving yourself permission to pretend because there's a difference between the actor and the character. Daniel Craig pretends to be James Bond. But at the same time, Who's pretending to be Daniel Craig? Because that's who you really are. There's something deeper. And so at the end of the day, again, there's a whole conversation that I don't want to be confusing to people, but <laughs> I can make this a five-hour conversation. And so slow down, check in. Does what I'm doing feel right? Does who I'm being feel right? Does any aspect of this make me feel hesitant? Does any aspect of this, like, is it cringy? Does any aspect of it make me feel guilty? And if that's the case, it might be due to like a limiting belief or something like that. And it might not necessarily be an authentic, or it might be a sign that, you, you know, your, your conscious, your gut feeling, your intuition, your whatever is telling you, this isn't you. There's something more, there's something greater. Like this isn't what you're meant to be doing. Something that uh, people love to say, I was in musical theater a little bit. And something that they love to say is the world is a stage. And I think it came from like sociology. Right. And then, uh, and we learn from neurolinguistic programming that to pretend is to enter into a delta brainwave state, you know, when you're imagining things and when you're being more childlike and when you're acting and that sort of thing, you're sort of like feeding into more, you're, you're coming authentically more from your subconscious mind than your conscious mind, because you're taking the, uh, the, you're changing the frame a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, and I wondered well, I, I think what you were alluding to is that uh, as long as your internal voice, as long as you're in alignment with your internal voice and you have integrity, you feel whole as a person, then uh, you're, I, I don't know about the mask thing, but you know, when you're in integrity with yourself and that's, that's when it actually feels good. That's when it actually feels like you. Yeah. So like my, my definition of integrity, really simple when what I think, say, and do are all in alignment. And so if I'm in integrity, I'm being authentic. Mm. And if I'm not, I'm not. If my actions aren't matching my thoughts, if what I believe and what I do are not the same, then I'm not being authentic. And so it's like from that space, check in with yourself. Yeah. You know, if you're if you're loving life, you're enjoying the moment and who you're being now is different than who you were being six months ago, five years ago, you know, great. That's life. You know, nothing stays the same. Everything's changing. You're always spiraling, hopefully up. <laughs> and so from that space, what is the moment call for me at this stage of my life, given what I want to create in the world? What version of me is needed? Because from a business perspective, the version of you that can create a six-figure business can't create a seven-figure business. 
that version of you has to die for the seven figure version of you to be born. Because the seven figure version of you sees life differently, takes different action, believes different things. It's a whole different version of you. Yep. So you're not the same you day to day, week to week, year to year. And physically, you're not the same you second to second. <laughs> so from that space, it's like, stop trying to put yourself into a box and can like, this is me. I'm some static thing that doesn't change. You are fluid. You're always moving. And it, it, yeah. Yeah, I would say that's the difficult part for me is that I'm always trying to differentiate between the authentic me of like who I want to be versus who I am. So then I'm like, man, if I strive to be this person and then I'm acting as if I'm that person already because that's who I want to be, but does it almost feels as if I'm being inauthentic with who I am. So like an example of that would be like, let's say I'm going to play basketball and I see the way these guys move and like they're moving a certain way. I feel inauthentic with trying to move that way because I'm like, I know I'm not that good yet. And so I see some of my friends who jump all in and they just go. And then like, they, they start trying to move like that. I feel like, dude, you're just trying to fake it, but literally they're just trying to get to where they want to go. So that that's the difficult part for me is like who I want to be is not who I am now. And then one feels more authentic, but this is who I want to be. So maybe I should start acting like that. And is that still authentic because I'm going where I want? So one thing I want to, I want to share with you. So when I'm working with people, a big aspect of it is helping people recognize how they create their experience of life. And so if I, if I may, can I speak to what you just talked about? Absolutely. So as an example, you see yourself with the basketball and you see the other guys, the way they're doing it. And then you say like, I'm going to try that. And then it feels inauthentic because it feels like you're like trying to be them or something like that. But notice it's, that's a creation based on how you define it. So it's like, I could grab the basketball and see them doing these crazy moves and I haven't put in that work. So then I try it. You look at me and by that definition, you would go, well, who are you trying to be? Like you're, you're trying to like fake it or whatever. But from my interpretation, it's I'm just trying it. Mm. I want to see if I can do it. I want to see, you know, what it's like, just like a child would emulate an adult who does something that they look up to. They're not being inauthentic by trying to like, like my dad, there's a photo actually. Uh, this is actually fun. I'm gonna show. I'm gonna show this to everybody. <laughs> this is cool. So there's a photo of my dad when I was a kid. He's literally playing the guitar and singing. And I've got this little mic, and I'm probably like, I don't, I'm four. I don't know. Little head of curly afro. <laughs> and in this picture, that mic I'm using is fake, or it's pretend. Or it's not a real mic. Am I being inauthentic? Mm. No, I'm just. Be, I want to be like dad in that moment, right? Because, but there's no inner conflict mm -hmm. in that moment. It's like a really exciting, beautiful thing. And so I often tell people, it's not fake it until you make it. It's be it until you see it. Mm. Be the version of it that you can be now. They might be level 50 because of the work they've put in and you're level one, but it's still the same thing. It's just an earlier process of it, mm -hmm. earlier step on the process. And so it's not about, you know, if I look and I see something out there, there's an expression, if you spot it, you got it. Yeah. Anything you notice in the external world, you only notice it because it's in you. Mm. Otherwise, you wouldn't see it. And so if you judge somebody else, it's because you judge yourself. That's the only reason. And so if I see something in another that I admire, in this case, their skill with a basketball, at some level, I recognize that I can do that too. Now, I might not be able to do that in this moment because I haven't put in the work. But just that excitement, like that desire to learn that or to be able to do that, that's a sign that, all right, if, if you would like to pursue that, go for it. You know, so I, I think that how we define being inauthentic, we typically are, it's not typically, we, we're always creating our experience. And so something like I have a framework that I share with clients that life happens in three stages. Stage one is life happens, always neutral. Stage two is I interpret it. And stage three is I experience my interpretation. Mm. And so with that in mind, most people operate on a two-step framework and it's unconscious. Life happens, I experience life how it is. And that's not how it works because human beings are not objective. We are subjective by nature, which is part of NLP, because experience comes in through our five senses and then through our thinking. All of that is inside of you though. And then you have beliefs that it's all filtered through. So you don't see the world the way it is. You see it the way you are, which is why I said earlier, you can have a crime scene as an example and 50 people witness a crime, but all 50 get interviewed and all 50 report it differently. 
How is it that 50 different stories came out when only one thing happened? Because you've got 50 different realities trying to describe. Everyone's got a different way of seeing the world. And so going back to life happens, I interpret it. So if it's raining outside, neutral. But if you say to me, hey, Jamil, how you feeling? I'm really angry. I'm frustrated. I'm pissed off. And you go, why? And I go, it's raining outside. <laughs> but then you go, what do you mean? And I go, you know, I had all these plans. I was going to go hiking and now I can't do any of that. And like, oh my God, like whatever else I say, you know, the streets are going to get flooded. It's horrible. But then you go to the guy up the street and you say, Derek, you, you seem really happy. I am. Why? It's raining outside. And then you go, what do you mean? And Derek goes, well, the most precious resource on the planet is raining down from the sky. Can you guys still hear me, by the way? Because it froze for a few seconds. Yeah. yeah. It's like the most precious resource on the planet raining down from the sky. My plants are getting watered. I'm getting a free car wash. Like whatever else he says, I'm going to go play in a puddle. He's happy. Now, both of those people, me and that guy, would tell you that how we feel is because of the rain. How is it that the rain makes me feel depressed and angry and sad and bitter or whatever, and it makes him feel happy and ecstatic and joyful? It doesn't. The rain doesn't do that. If you have a flat tire and I say, hey, Tony, why are you so angry? And you go, I have a flat tire. Piece of rubber that's deflated can't do that. It doesn't have that power. Only you do. So when we recognize that whatever I'm feeling and experiencing is never because of the moment, it's my interpretation of the moment. Mm. That's where you connect to so much of your power. So if you realize in that moment, in the basketball example, I feel fake right now, or I feel inauthentic. It's not because you are that. It's because in the moment you're thinking that you are that. Mm -hmm. And the thought is creating everything downstream. But all you got to do is question the thought. All you have to do is challenge it and recognize that it's just a thought. It doesn't have any meaning or power unless the meaning, other than the meaning and the power you give it. Yep. And it just changes everything. And yeah, that leads me to so much other stuff, actually. <laughs> so I've actually been talking to my girlfriend about this is like your circumstances do not dictate your emotions, which is basically what you're talking about. And I, I explained that to her is like, you know, she allows herself to have that reality of like, okay, if, if I get mandated to work, I'm not going to work out. Okay, well, now you're saying that if you get mandated to work seven days a week, now your health is no longer important to you and you're not going to do it. So like for me, I'm like, I got rear ended. I'm still going to the gym. Like literally on my way to the gym, I got rear-ended. That's not going to stop me from going to the gym. It just shortened my workout by 20 minutes because now I got a 20 minute less workout. Um, so it's like, but I'm trying to figure out at what point do circumstances actually affect your emotions or like, you know, I have an emotion. I don't get to choose whether I have that emotion or not. It just kind of comes up, but it is my perception of it. But then like, at what point is it not? So like, let's say every single one of my family members died in a car wreck. Like now I'm choosing to feel sad or am I choosing that because it's just an emotion that comes up. So at what point is it your circumstances and like you can control it? So again, beautiful question. It's, I'm going to answer it. It's nuanced. The, the, the general answer is truth is truth. And what I mean by that is if something is true, like genuinely true, like a universal, it's true. It's true all the time. Mm -hmm. If something is like, like if like uh, I'm like, is this podcast also video or just audio? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm holding something for those who are just listening. If I let this go, does it ever go up? No. It always goes down, at least on Earth, right? Because on Earth we have the law of gravity. Hundred percent, it applies. So in that same way, you said like, at what point do your circumstances basically cause or create your emotions? Never. Now, at the same time, we're also human beings. And so there is, it's not like we're not robots. And so from this space, first of all, keep in mind that there's no such thing, even though in like emotional release work, we might identify as negative emotions. They're not, negative doesn't mean bad. There's no such thing as a bad emotion. So happiness and sadness are just emotions. Sadness isn't worse. It's not bad or evil or wrong or anything like that. So if people that you love die or if you get rear-ended or something happens in your life by all means grieve respond the way that you feel is appropriate but when we recognize that when you get rear-ended i'll give you i'll give you a different example if i'm driving and i get cut off in traffic which in the past you know that's happened and let's say i get cut off the guy who cuts me off which might not even be a guy but let's say it's a guy the guy who cuts me off 
he cuts me off. We almost get into an accident. And in the moment, there's like rage or there's what the hell? Maybe some fun curse words flying out. And it's like, what is it that, you know, what's wrong with this guy? Right now, the thought underneath it, which usually we're not conscious of because it, it all happened so quickly, is some variation of I could have died. Maybe there's people I cared about in the car with me that he could have hurt them, made me even more angry. He didn't respect me. I, I, he didn't see me. I was here. Like, what's wrong with that guy? And, and a whole bunch of other stuff. But now what changes if I shift the thought to that guy is rushing to the hospital right now because his wife is in the back seat, literally going into labor and he didn't see me. And literally as he rushed and I honked, he was like, sorry. And he kept going. Now that's equally as possible. So from that space, which is now my go-to like immediately, because it's been kind of entrained in me, somebody cuts me off. It's not what's wrong with this person is I hope that person's okay. Mm -hmm. I hope, you know, something's not going on for that person. Now it's just as possible that they were just being rude. It's just as possible that they just didn't care and they wanted to speed in front of me to get in front of me. But I have the choice over time to condition myself to say whether or not I'm going to assume the worst or assume something that's you know more positive <clears throat> that would serve the emotional state that I would like. But in general, whatever emotions you're feeling, you're feeling it because of a meaning that you're giving to the situation. There are cultures in the world that when somebody dies, they have a celebration. It's not a funeral in the way that we do in the West. Now they can still be sad, but they're not sad for the other person. They're sad for themselves. They're sad because, you know, I'm not going to get to hug this person anymore. Physically, they're not going to be in my life. But the experience that they have, let's say, as a group, as a collective, would be a celebration of life. And that celebration is, we're so grateful that we had this person for the time that we did, regardless of how long it was. We're so grateful for the experiences that we shared, for who that person was for us. You know, the interactions that we had, what we learned from them. Yeah, we're sad. But we're all so grateful. We're also all these things. And that experience, maybe now there's some laughter. There's some fun stories being told. There's reminiscing. The experience as a whole is positive. And again, I'm not saying positive is better, but it's it, think of it as what's useful. Like, what do you want to feel? What would serve you? And so if somebody dies and my internal representation of that is, I can't take this. I need that person without them. Like I'm incomplete or like life is over. Like I can't go, I can't go on. If that's the internal representation, there's a difference between pain and suffering. Pain is what happens in terms of like your like the felt experience, maybe like my you stab me, you scratch me, like my nerve endings are getting stimulated, my internal organ is pierced, like whatever it is, right? That's pain. Suffering is the story that we tell ourselves about the pain. Mm. And that's why suffering can last for days, weeks, months, decades later long beyond the physical pain going away. So what's the story that we're telling ourselves? And this is, keep in mind, I've been doing this for almost 20 years. And so this isn't a matter of, yes, something happens and you react immediately. The beauty though is how quickly can you catch yourself reacting versus responding? Okay. Responding is based on a choice. Reacting is just kind of instinctual. And so something happens and you just you just immediately get angry, but catch yourself, slow down. Yep. Why am I feeling what I'm feeling? What's my interpretation? What am I making up about this situation? Most of the time, what you're making up is inaccurate. You're making something up about the intentions of the other person. It's almost never accurate. And even if it is, it still has nothing to do with why you feel what you feel. You feel what you feel because of your interpretation. You know, I, I don't consider myself a religious person and more of like a spiritual person with all the different stuff I've looked into. But there's a biblical quote that really sums it up that we can finish this story on, you know, Jesus getting crucified. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's the highest level of, in my mind, what I'm saying. It's Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Because from their perspective, killing me is a good idea. From their perspective, they're doing right by you. Because I'm the blasphemer. I'm the one like taking your name in vain. I'm, and so they're like, I can't let this stand. What an affront on God. So from their perspective, they're doing the right thing. So in that same kind of way, anyone who would hurt you, hurt people, hurt people. People who are filled with love and peace and joy in their heart, they're not going around killing people. You know, uh, people who are thriving in business aren't the ones telling you that, you know, 
dream smaller. They're not the one telling you, you can't do it. I remember hearing, you mentioned 10X earlier, Tony. I remember hearing Grant Cardone talk about, he's like, if I was talking to Warren Buffett and I said, like, uh, Uncle Warren, and he goes, I want to, uh, I want to make a billion dollars. And he's like, Warren Buffett would say in Grant Cardone's words, you know, do it, man. Like, go ahead, go for it. But he goes, but you talk to your neighbor or your cousin or your uncle and you say, I want to make a billion dollars. And they say, you know, why? Like, you don't need that. And it's like, you know, we accept you the way you are. And it's like, you know, why do you need that? And it's like a whole different way of looking at it. They don't believe they can do it. So they project it out on you. And so that same kind of way, going back to that story, you know, at least assuming it's accurate, there's Christ on the cross getting crucified, but he's not thinking, screw these people, they're killing me. They're such bad people, evil. No, he's going, I have so much compassion and love for these people as I'm getting killed because I know that that's not who they are. They're they're ignorant, they're insecure, they're misguided, they're fearful, and they're acting out of that. But that's true of everything. Anyone ever in your life who you think disrespected you, hurt you, did anything to you, they were coming from that same space. Hmm. You get to decide, am I going to meet them at that space and try to fight fire with fire? Never works. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. talks about darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. You want peace. You don't get there through war. You want love with somebody. You don't get there through an argument. You don't get there through criticism. You don't get there through hate. So check yourself and check in. Is like is what I'm about to say, like there's a Buddhist philosophy. It's some variation of, is what I'm about to say kind? Is it loving? Is it true? And I think there's one more. But it's like, and if it's not, why am I going to say it? Usually because I'm feeling hurt and I'm just kind of, I want to lash out. I want to feel better about myself. I want to get even. I want to, but this is all just an internal story. And so it's like, we hold ourselves back from the peace and the happiness and the love that we could always be experiencing now. We play small out out of these, you know, we can choose fear or we can choose love. We can choose abundance. We can choose scarcity. How do you want to play? We can choose how we define our reality or we can delude ourselves into believing that the definition is already out there. But just like you said to your girlfriend, if the external circumstance ever caused the emotion, then every time that external circumstance happens, everyone in the world who experiences that would feel the same way about it. That's, and they don't. that's exactly what I said, actually, is there's other people out there that are going through the same exact circumstances who are doing different, doing different things or experiencing different things. So that's one, one point that I always try to remind myself is remind yourself of the truth of the situation. So like, you know, if I got rear ended or whatever, like that doesn't mean the person was like upset or like just being distracted or, you know, stupid, um, you know, it just could have been a circumstance. Um, but then the other thing that I do want to actually talk more about is, uh, understanding doesn't make something okay necessarily. So like in your example, the interesting thing is you said that like, okay, I now understand why that guy cut me off and because he did that, but it doesn't make it okay. So what I want to say about that is I thought about this is like, okay, let's say there's an abusive boyfriend, right? And he's just abusing the girlfriend. And then I've noticed this a lot myself. I had some trauma when I was a kid and people excuse behavior based on past. So then if you understand that that abusive boyfriend, well, he was abused by his father. Okay, cool. Now I know why he does that. But the interesting thing is a lot of people think that now it's okay. Now it's okay that that person cut you off because they're rushing to the hospital. That doesn't make it okay. I understand now why they did it, but it doesn't make it okay. It doesn't make it okay that those people killed Jesus, but now we understand why they did it. So we have empathy toward him. So I just think that's an interesting nuance of us understanding doesn't make the behavior okay. Absolutely. And I think that when we think about, for example, the word forgiveness, for, for many people, forgiveness, because of the way we define it, very different interpretations. For some people, if I forgive that person for killing my sister or for cutting me off or for doing whatever they did, for you know firing me, for cheating on my wife, you know whatever they did, if I forgive it, that somehow I make it okay. Mm-hmm. Somehow I condone it. And my definition of forgiveness has nothing to do with condoning something, making it okay. Forgiveness for me is you releasing yourself from the prison of the past that you're keeping yourself in by holding on to something that let, that let you go a long time ago. And so from that headspace, I hear what you're saying. It's not about understanding doesn't mean it's okay because part of forgiveness and self-love is if I'm in an abusive relationship, 
and I understand why my partner does what they do because they were abused and the way they see the world. That doesn't mean I let myself get abused. That doesn't mean I don't have boundaries. It doesn't mean I don't enforce those boundaries. It doesn't mean I don't remove myself from the situation if it no longer serves me. You know, that guy who cut me off, or in your example, the guy who rear ends me. Now, first I get to choose how I want to interpret it. Now, there's still an external reality. My car is still totaled, let's say, right? And I'm going to have to deal with that. But how I deal with it is going to determine how I feel about it. And so now let's say, or how I feel, it, it goes both ways. But think about it like this. Maybe my interpretation is, you know what? That guy slammed on the brakes, didn't expect that. I smashed into him, so I rear-ended him, but let's say it was his fault. And so now, but maybe my interpretation is, you know, who knows? What if I would have gotten to another car accident, a worse one, and died? And this guy saved my life by stopping that from happening. And now my car got totaled instead of me getting totaled. Well, there's no way to prove that that would have happened. But let's say I would have played with that idea. I'm going to autom automatically feel different about it. In a weird way, I might even have some gratitude <laughs> for this guy. But now I might say, are you okay? And he goes, yeah, I'm okay. And it's like, you know, okay, now we're going to deal with the practical side of it. There's the insurance, there's this, there's that. Somehow this is going to get paid for. I got to get wherever I'm going without a car right now or whatever I got to do. But am I dealing with that experience with peace in my heart and love in my heart or am I dealing with that experience with anger and hatred and whatever else? It's a very different experience. I have in my own life and in many people that I know have experienced something happened. The person experienced frustration and anger and bitterness and whatever else. Excuse me. And six hours later, they're still talking about it and they're still just as angry and it's not happening anymore. So recognize there's like, it's almost like the ocean. The ocean from the surface has waves. Now, what are the waves? The waves are the meeting point between the current, the wind, the moon, and a bunch of, maybe a bunch of other stuff. And that creates a wave. In that same way, there's your internal interpretation, your internal reality that meets the external experience and that creates your experience. And so earlier we talked about the inauthenticity and I talked about, it's not really about what you do. It's about who you're being when you do it. And so in that same way, it's not about what happens. It's who am I going to be that meets what happens? Because that's what's going to create the experience. If who, uh, if who I'm being when I get, when I rear end or get rear ended is what's wrong with that guy, something like, and I just get all nasty about it. I am missing the point that I get it. It's a car and maybe you love that car and it's important to you. Again, it's meaning that you're generating, but it is just a car. It's just a piece of metal or a piece of whatever your car, fiberglass or carbon, whatever your car is made out of. It's just a piece of metal. And the human life that you are, at least in this lifetime, it's okay. And maybe there's people in your car too. They're okay. Even if they weren't, even if you hit your head horribly and you woke up in the hospital, you know, you're alive. Like, how do you want to play with it? It's 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 almost like life is like Play-Doh. For anyone growing up back in, I don't even know if that's still a thing, but back in the day when I was a kid, <laughs> we'd have Play-Doh and it's like this putty kind of thing, clay, and you can shape it however you want. It comes out of the carton and it's in its shape and make whatever you want with it. Life is like that. Life experience happens and it's like you being handed Play-Doh. What do you want to create with it? And if you're going to create, and it's never bad or wrong, like your, your, your partner is not wrong in her interpretation. You can't be wrong in an interpretation. It's like an opinion, right? You can't have a, you can't be wrong in your opinion. It's your opinion, but it doesn't mean it's true, but for you, it's true. So now in this example, it's not about what's true and not true. It's what's useful and not, not useful. Given the experience I want to have, will this interpretation serve me? Given the fact that I want to be really healthy and fit and work out, does it serve me to say, if I get called in, I don't want to exercise this week? And it's like, no, in that context, it doesn't. So then it's like rich dad, poor dad, Robert Kiyosaki. And he talks about his poor dad would say, I can't afford it. And his rich dad would say, how can I afford it? In that same way, well, I can't work out versus how can I work out? Well, maybe I can't go to the gym for two hours, but maybe I can wake up and do 20 push-ups, and then every 15 minutes stand up and do some air squats. Mm. Like I can still find a way to be active, right? There's always a way to shift the way you relate to an experience 
And uh, just in just as a kind of caveat to anyone listening who there's never anything I say, which is intended to be disrespectful or because I know that this is a this is also as I'm sharing it, a perspective. And this is I'm not espousing this to be the truth. I'm saying this is at least my truth. And this is something that the people that I work with and in my own life, when they adopt this way of being, their life experience dramatically improves. And so if we were to try on what if nothing in and of itself is inherently good or bad, including death? What if life is? Step one, life happens in my three stages. And what if step two, my interpretation is everything for me? And step three, I experience that. So whenever I don't like my experience, look to my interpretation. Look to how am I creating this experience as nasty? The issue is never the issue. The issue is how you respond to the issue. The issue is how you see the issue, how you define the issue. You know, I remember Jack Sparrow talks about in parts of the Caribbean, the problem isn't the problem. The problem is the way you're seeing the problem. Mm. It's the same idea. Like, how do you look at it? It's not what you look at. It's what you see. It's not what I say. It's what you hear. Sometimes what I say and what you hear are very different. Sometimes what you look at and what you actually see are very different. Two people walk up to a painting in a museum and one goes, oh my gosh, and they just, they, they, they like rant about how amazing it is and how amazing the artist was. And you look at it and you go, it's a yellow square. <laughs> and like it's like modern art, like you don't like see it, but they see the genius of it. But it's like a Rorschach test, like the ink the ink block test, the ink blot test. There we go. The, the the therapist, psychiatrist will say, a psychologist, what do you see? Now, whatever you see is not actually on that paper. The only thing on that paper is ink. There is not a face or a cloud or a dragon or whatever you see. But what you're seeing is the projection of what's inside. And that's why they use it as a way to go deeper. And so in that same way. When you see things in the world and you judge them, it's because you judge yourself for that. When you see people that do things that you really admire, it's because at some level you recognize yourself in them. You recognize, I can do that too. You see someone on stage speaking to 50,000 people and you are afraid to speak in public. But at some level, you know that you're capable of that. And if some aspect of that really gravitates towards you, then that could be a sign of, I could do that too. You know, that person didn't start at 50,000. They started in their bedroom looking in the mirror. <laughs> and so it's like you start however you start. But again, how are you going to interpret your life experience? And this applies to business. It applies to relationships. COVID happened and, you know, different businesses are getting shut down. Some businesses said, oh my God, they're brick and mortar. We can't do anything. And they went out of business. Other ones said, I guess we got to pivot. And they decided to go online and now they stayed online or they do a hybrid, but they make way more money now than they did before. Other people said, oh my God, the world's ending. And they kind of shut down other people and they stayed in their home for like months. Other people said, how can I help? And they went around knocking on doors, just like leaving a bag of toilet paper and helping people. How are you choosing to meet circumstance? How are you choosing to show up in the world? Your girlfriend, your wife, your husband, they're mad at you. Okay, how do you choose to meet that? Do you meet that by making them wrong? Because that's just going to cause an argument. Or do you show up as, I'm going to hear them out. I'm going to find out what they're feeling. Honey, what's going on? You know, And then what happened? And then what happened? I did that? Wow. And when I did that, what did that mean to you? Whoa, that was the last thing I wanted that to mean. I'm so sorry. And then the problem's gone. Because you approached it that way. Same thing with the help. And it, this applies to all of it. Like to me, the highest level of coaching when I'm working with people is who is this conversation? Who are you being? How are you showing up? How are you defining your reality? Almost always unconsciously, which is then creating an experience that you then blame on the outside world and you blame on other people when it's got nothing to do with them, at least from a felt experience, which makes you a victim to life. A victim lives at effect versus being at cause. And if we're coming to be cause saying my external life experience is as a result of me being the cause, what I do and don't do, say and don't say, how I show up and don't show up, et cetera, we're so much more powerful than we realize every one of us is the creator of our own life. And so going back to, you know, who are you or who am I? We are this moment. We are who we decide to be. 
we are nothing up until this point, meaning you can define yourself by your past and then live like you used to, but you're going to keep creating more of the same. Or you can let it go and you can be who you decide to be right now. So there you are looking at the basketball guy in that story saying, I'd love to be like that. Great. Start now. Like you might not, it might extert the external world takes time to catch up. You know, business results take time to show up. If you want to lose weight. There's a story I love sharing about um, Arnold Schwarzenegger. When he was early on in his bodybuilding career, he was training to become Mr. Austria. But his identification, his state of being was, I am Mr. Olympia. He hadn't won yet, even Mr. Austria. So he can't even qualify yet, right? And from that space, he'd be in one of these bodybuilding gyms and people are working out and four hours go by and everyone's leaving and Arnold's still there. And someone goes, hey, Arnold, come on, we're all leaving. And he goes, no, no, Mr. Olympia works out six hours. So that's the same thing as saying, I, I want to be that way in basketball. And then you pause and you go, okay, how would that version of me dribble the ball? How would that version of me practice? How would that version of me, what work would he put in? You know, it's different from what you do now because you don't have the result. Anytime you don't have a result in your life, it's because you're not being the version of you that could have that result. And so that's why I said the six-figure version of you is very different from the seven-figure version of you, who's completely different from the eight-figure version of you, and et cetera. And so it's like, how am I choosing to show up? How am I defining myself in a way that limits me? And we do it all the time. And people I work with for years, they still fall into the trap. I still fall into the trap. It's just, it happens less. <laughs> and when it happens, no one's perfect. But when you do it less and less and less, more often than not, your life reflects that new awareness and results happen that you want and things unfold really beautifully. That's awesome. All right, Dr. Jamil, you've been dropping some bombs. <laughs> Everybody who's listening is getting uh, a lot of value from this. We need to wrap up the podcast and uh, we just have a final question that we ask everybody and we're, we're just projecting. So, uh, you know, like, uh, <laughs> your mental, emotional release wise, I guess you could just float above now, float 70 years out into the future. You're on your deathbed and, uh, you're about to die. You have a final message to the world. It's a, it's your legacy. It's a paragraph, a mantra, a sentence It is your legacy. The last thing that people are going to know you for, and it's your message to the world. What is that message? So the word beautiful, what is beautiful? Beautiful is be you to full. Be the fullest expression of you. Live this life in such a way that you feel like there's a quote, when I stand before God at the end of my life, I hope I can say, I used everything you gave me. Like I had nothing left. Yeah, I literally have that. It's right, right next to the game. <laughs> That's amazing. So perfect. And so in that same way, <laughs> how can I live my life in such a way that regardless of how long I live, when my head hits the pillow, I can think, wow, what a day. And if I do that, I will create what I call an extraordinary life without regret. And this is that last part to it. I often finish messages by saying, create a meaningful day, all my love, Jamil. And I've had people, excuse me, say to me, how do I do that? Like, what do you mean? How do I create a meaningful day? You create a meaningful day by creating a meaningful moment right now. And a meaningful moment is what could you do right now that would move you in the direction that you want to be in? And so from that space, that creates a meaningful moment. And if you do a string of those, you create a meaningful day. And if you do that day by day by day, you create a meaningful life. And it doesn't really matter how long that life is, whether you're five or whether you're 95 or 105, either way, be you, too full, show up, live the life that is authentic to you, not the life other people expect of you. And, and be, be love as a verb, be loving in everything that you say, do, and think. Love it. So how do our uh, listeners get a hold of you if they want to reach out for coaching or do you have any books or what else do you offer that uh, our listeners could get a hold of you for? Yeah, I appreciate you asking. Yeah, so there's two books that I have. One you can get on the website. It's just gmailsiage.com. It's called 20 Steps to Your Next Breakthrough. I made that uh, several years ago, but it's still great. It's a short PDF on purpose. It's like 74 pages. There's an ebook and an audiobook version. 
And it was designed to be every chapter is like one to three pages, hard hitting, practical tools. You can use it. And it was like, how can somebody just go from completely stuck to into some momentum? That was the purpose of that one. The second book is called Leaders with a Heart. That's on Amazon. And it's a beautiful book. It's a multi-authored book that I got the privilege to be a part of. And in it, I share in my chapter, I share my story with my dad, that story I've shared on the podcast, but in a little bit more, in probably a little bit more detail and um, still an amazing book regardless. And you can get that on Amazon. And as it relates to working with me and different ways I can serve, you know, I've been making content online for probably since 2015. Yeah. And so that is like 800 pieces of content, 900 pieces of content, videos, blog posts, podcasts, things like that. You can check out the podcast, Transformation Starts Today. You can check out Instagram is at Dr. Jamil Syed, Dr. Jamil Syed, Facebook and LinkedIn, just my name. And if you're looking to have a conversation, if this has resonated, if you're sitting here thinking either... I've got some challenges, problems I want help dealing with in my business, my mindset, my relationship, et cetera, not happy, not fulfilled, or you've got a goal that you're thinking five years out, 10 years out, let's make it real in nine months. Like, why do you got to wait five years? Why do you got to wait 10 years? I've had people so surprised when they show up with a goal that they think takes a decade and we make it happen in a year. And so it's like from that space, if I can serve, I'd love to have a conversation with you. You can book it on jamilsayage.com. And uh, the link that I sent to Tony the other day, it's a one link that's got everything I'm talking about. And so you can get it all in there. Cool. We'll make sure to include that as well. And uh, yeah, do you have any final thoughts that you want to share? First of all, just thank you to both of you. This has been a lot of fun. Love the questions. Very like thoughtful questions. And uh, love the background, Tony, that you and I share. And that's awesome. And Dakota, like I said, your questions have been awesome. And uh Thank you to everyone who's tuning in and listening. You know, I truly believe that our time, our attention, our energy, the greatest resources, assets that we have and how you choose to spend them, deploy them matters. And I don't take it lightly that you were here with us today. And the fact that you were here, I hope that today served you. I hope that there was at least one piece and one nugget from anything that was shared between the three of us that can help you live your life differently, help you interpret things differently, see things differently. And if it did, I'd recommend you listen to this more than once. I'd recommend you share it. I recommend you do what you can to like, there's a, there's a great quote to finish with. And there's a quote, Gandhi said it, you know, Jesus says it, be the change you wish to see in the world. You know, live your life from a space of I'm going to go first. Whenever you think, you know, people should really do something about this. That should set the alarm off in your head. You're talking about yourself. You should do something about this. People should be kinder to one another. Start with you. Uh, you know, strangers should like love each other. So you love strangers, like start with you, be the change you want to see in the world. It gets so much better from there. Yeah. Well, I definitely know that a lot of people got value from this and you said more than one thing for sure. So I'm sure there's going to be multiple, multiple takeaways. I know you talked a lot about truth and uh, how you can like feel it and you can hear it. And whenever you speak, like I've seen it in every single other person that I see that's successful is doing big things. They're, they're just, you're echoing everything that every other person is saying. And that comes from personal responsibility. So yeah, thank you for everything that you shared, for sharing your story. And we appreciate you coming on. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. All right, man. Have a good day, brother. Absolutely. Take care. All right. Peace.